So now that I've explained what pipelining is, let's now build a five-stage pipeline for our processor. So we've already seen before how I took all of the circuits that are involved in executing one instruction and I broke them up into five stages where there's a latch separating every pair of stages. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'm going to take this five-stage circuit over here and I'm going to pipeline it. That means you can have a new instruction rolling in every new cycle. So this is what that pipeline is going to look like, right? So an instruction in its first cycle accesses the instruction memory stage. There's a program counter that serves as input over here. That gets latched over here. This is latch two. Then it reads something from the register file, stores that result in latch three. That serves as input to the ALU. The result of that gets stored in latch four serves as input to the data memory stage, result gets placed in latch 5, and then finally you write into the register file. And while that first instruction is going through these five stages in five consecutive cycles, you have a second instruction that starts up over here. In cycle 2, it reads the instruction memory. In cycle 3, it moves on to reading its registers, and so on. Similarly, in cycle 3, you have a third instruction entering the pipeline. And, and so on, right? So ultimately, by the time you get to cycle five, your pipeline has warmed up, where in one cycle, you have five different instructions that are in different stages of execution. So there are five instructions being executed in parallel, and they're all doing different things at the same time. Okay, so this is how you kind of fill up your pipeline. Now let me talk about a few more details about what's happening in every single stage. Okay, so let's look at this register read over here. I'm going to introduce a few notions and these are being introduced to kind of simplify our design and make understanding it a little easier. But over time you'll see that these concepts can be extrapolated so you can build an 8 stage pipeline or a 10 stage pipeline and you might make different assumptions as you start building those different pipelines. But I'm going to introduce a few assumptions as I describe this particular 5 stage pipeline. So as far as register read is concerned, I'm going to make sure that I perform my register read in the second half of the second cycle. Okay, and why exactly I'm doing that will be made clear shortly. What, what is happening over here in cycle 5 is I need to write something into the register file. I'm going to again assume that this write of the register file can happen in half a cycle. So I'm going to use the first half of the cycle to perform my register write. The reason I'm doing this is instruction 1 is executing here. And it might be producing a result that gets written into, say, register R1. And that might be an instruction over here. This is instruction 5 coming in. Sorry, let's look at an instruction here. This is instruction 4, which began execution over here, arrives at the register read stage over here. And like I had assumed, the register read is performed in the second half of the cycle. So if instruction I4 wants to read R1 and perform some math with that, this sequence of operations would actually be safe, right? Because the way the programmer wrote the program, this I1 comes first, produces a result that gets placed in R1, and then I4 comes later and reads the result in R1. So essentially the value I'm reading in I4 should be the value being produced by I1. If I design it in this way, the pipeline is going to work correctly because at this in this first half of cycle five, I produced a new result, wrote it into R1, so if I read that value in the second half of cycle 5, I should get that latest update of R1. If I had done it any earlier, right, so if I3 had tried to read R1, it would have performed the read down here, and that's earlier in time than the update of register R1. So what you would be proceeding with at this point is some old stale value of R1. Okay, so essentially a read or the consumption of a value has to be kind of delayed in time. And so at the very least, the instruction that's consuming the value produced by I1 has to start in cycle 4 or later, and then things are fine. right? And so finishing the write in half a cycle and finishing the read in the second half of the cycle makes it easier to transfer a value from here to this guy over here. If I'd assumed that register read and register write take up an entire cycle, then the consuming instruction would have to start no earlier than cycle 5, right? You could have only performed a read over here if your write was taking the entire cycle over here. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about data dependencies later, but that's kind of the reason why I've introduced this notion of a half cycle register read and, and a half cycle register write over here. 
Okay, next concept to pay attention to is you'll see that there is this wire that kind of bypasses the data memory stage. And that's because not every instruction has to look at the data memory unit, right? If it's only a load and a store instruction that has to go through the data memory stage where you produce an address over here, and then that address is used to look up the data memory and then onwards. But if you're just doing an add operation, that add operation completes here, gets stored in latch L4 up here. And then in the data memory stage, you don't have to do anything. All that's happening is the value is getting transferred from latch 4 to latch 5. And then eventually in the fifth cycle is when you perform a write into the register file. So the question is, you know, could I have skipped this data memory stage altogether and performed a register write in cycle 4? Well, that's not possible because you can't jump ahead of an instruction that is before you, right? So if the instruction before you is a load instruction, it has to go through all five stages. If you skip one of your steps, then both of you converge on the register write stage at the same time, right? And then that's, that's asking a little too much of the register write stage. And it does not really improve performance a whole lot as well. Okay, so keep in mind that every instruction has to go through all of these five stages. And there's no way for you to jump ahead of an instruction that is before you. Okay, now I'm just going to quickly walk through the five stages and just keep track of and, and just remind you of what is happening in each of those stages, right? So we said that the first stage is the instruction memory stage, which is fed by the program counter. Every cycle, the program counter also increments itself by default by four. And occasionally when you have a branch or a jump instruction, it changes to a completely different value. The instruction that is fetched is stored in latch L2 here. That's, that's got my 32-bit instruction, tells me which registers I need to read, and then I go ahead and read those registers. I should also point out that branches complete in the second cycle. Okay, so I'm going to make some very aggressive assumptions about how to finish a branch as early as possible. Okay, and you'll soon see why I've made this aggressive assumption. So I'm going to assume that if the instruction is of this form, branch and equal to, let's say, comparing registers R1, R2, and then you may have to jump to an offset that is say 100 bytes from here. Okay, so you've read that instruction and stored it into L2. Now in the second cycle, I'm going to read registers R1 and R2. That happens in the second half of the cycle here. Then I'm going to make those two values go through a simple comparator unit, right? So this is like an ALU that performs subtraction, checks to see if the result is zero. If the result is zero, then it basically increments the PC by four and then adds this offset of 100 and then goes on to update the value of PC. So that in the third cycle, you know exactly where this branch is supposed to jump to. Okay, so there's a lot that happened in that second cycle, right? I read register values, I compared them, I, I added an increment to the program counter, and I updated the program counter, right? So there's a lot happening, and this is clearly a very aggressive assumption. Typically, processors would build like a 10-stage pipeline, and it'll take you know three or four stages to figure out exactly which way a branch is going. But in this case, I've built this relatively small and simple five-stage pipeline, and I have aggressively assumed that a branch gets resolved as early as the second stage itself. Even with that aggressive assumption, you'll see that something bad has possibly happened here, right? So by default, I said that there's a program counter here, and by default, the program counter increments by four every single cycle. So I was at PC over here, I was at PC plus four over here, and without knowing which way the branch was going, I had already started fetching the next instruction here. Okay, once this branch is completed at the end of the second cycle, I can go ahead and update the program counter. That allows me to fetch the correct instruction in cycle three. But in the meantime, some other instruction has possibly slipped through over here, right? So maybe this branch, maybe R1 and R2 are equal, and I need to jump somewhere else in the code. But in the meantime, I've gone ahead and fetched the next instruction that comes after the branch. And that has snuck into the pipeline over here and is supposed to execute as instruction two. Okay, but having resolved the branch, I now know that this instruction should not have executed and I should be jumping and fetching this instruction here. And that's indeed what happens in cycle three. Okay, but I, what I also need to now do is make sure that I squash the second instruction. So this instruction that snuck in gets killed and basically a cycle goes by where nothing useful gets performed, right? So this is equivalent to introducing a bubble in the pipeline, right? So useful instruction entering here, useful instruction entering here, 
and here's a bubble where something useless entered the pipeline and eventually got squashed okay so so an instruction completes here nothing completes in this cycle over here in cycle 6 and then something useful completes in cycle 7 right so as instructions finish you occasionally have these cycles where nothing useful completes and that's referred to as a bubble or a stall cycle okay so even with these aggressive assumptions of a branch finishing in the second cycle I still ended up having one stall cycle because my branch decided to jump somewhere else that means the branch was taken that means I had to go down over here and what ended up happening is I fetched this next instruction which should not have been executed if my branch had finished in four cycles and potentially looking at three stall cycles between the completion of two useful instructions right so to reduce the number of these stall cycles I made this aggressive assumption that a branch would finish as early as the second cycle. Okay, now let's move on to the third stage. This is relatively straightforward. You've read the register values, those feed as inputs to the ALU, and you perform some math, right? So this could be where the addition happens for an add instruction, or for a load instruction, this is where an offset gets added to the register that you just read. Then in the fourth stage is when I'm going to read from the data memory if this is a load instruction. I'm going to write something in, into the data memory if this is a store instruction. So a store inst instruction is pretty much done at this stage, right? Once a store instruction has written something into the data memory unit, there's really nothing more it needs to do, right? It's, it still has to go through a fifth stage where you're seemingly writing something to a register entry, but stores don't write to registers, right? So it really does nothing in this stage. So a store has really completed in the fourth cycle itself. But Pretty much every other instruction you know, is going to go through this fifth stage where the result that it has produced gets written into the register file. Okay, so that's what happens in the fifth stage. The result of the computation gets written into the register file. So let's just summarize what these different instruction types are doing in these different stages. So there's of course the instruction memory stage which everybody goes through. Then in the register read stage, if you're an add instruction, if you're trying to add the contents of R1 and R2, that's where you read the values of R1 and R2 from the register file. If you're doing a branch, again, you read the values of R1 and R2. In case of a branch, you're doing a lot more in that second stage. You're performing a comparison. You're accordingly setting the PC as well. And at that, st and at that point, you're done. There's nothing you have to do in stages three, four, and five. A load instruction goes through the full five-stage pipeline. In the register read stage, it reads its single register operand, performs the address calculation in the ALU stage, in this case adding an offset of 8 to the register R3, gets the data from the data memory stage, and the result of this entire operation gets written into the destination register R6 in that last fifth stage. For a store, in the register read stage, you're going to read R3 because you need that to compute the address, you're also going to read R6 because that's the value that's going to get written into the data memory stage. So there are two register operands you read in, in cycle 2. Perform the address calculation in cycle 3 where you're adding the offset 8 to register R3. In the data memory stage, you're writing the contents, you're, you're writing the value in R6 into that particular address and then you're done. There's nothing you need to do in the register write stage. So these are the five stages and these are the operations that these different instructions perform in each one of these stages.